Community. It is my honor to welcome you all to our fundraising event, A Night of Hope. We're so excited that you're here. My name is Mariah Hansen. I am a previous fundraising director for Cure UIUC and um, your host. Please help yourselves to the appetizers even throughout the event. And um, if you'll notice on your table, these cards. These cards highlight some of our Cure Kids, and if you would like to write them a letter, um, just to, to encourage them as they're in the Cure Hospital, free, feel free to do that. Um, I would like to welcome up Abby Gaffner, Cure UIUC's founder and president, and Mark Prakash, Cure's vice president, and they're going to tell you a little bit about Cure International and Cure UIUC. Um, so, as Mariah said, I am Abby, and I am a senior here at University of Illinois, and I'm studying pre-med, so it's kind of what got me first interested in the incredible work of Cure International, kind of medical missions, um, yeah, deal. So who is Cure? So Cure International is... years ago, um, there was a couple it, at a church in the Northeast, and they told their small group, hey, can you begin to pray for us? We are going into retirement. And so, you know, they just weren't planning on God really answering those prayers in huge ways. And from that small group praying for them began Cure International because he was an orthopedic surgeon. And so since then, in the last 22 years, Cure International has grown from their first one hospital in Kenya to now over 29 hospitals all over the world, um, including being the largest provider of club foot services in India, and they just have impacted so many lives from that. So, I mean, tonight we're going to hear the incredible work that God can do um, through um, Derek here, but yeah, let's always remember that. So. Their mission statement is healing the sick and proclaiming the kingdom of God. So who does Cure serve then? So Cure serves, as they like to say, Cure serves royalty. And so they're these precious children who are born in medically underserved areas who have curable physical uh, ailments. So they're born with club foot, cleft palate, hydrocephalus, which is when there's a bunch of fluid um, in your brain. and other uh, physical abnormalities and by nothing you know of their own were they born with these physical ailments and in places where medical treatment and uh, the opportunities the financial means to seek out services are available so if you were born with club foot here in the u.s chances are that within one year you it would be completely uh, cured but the kids that we raise money for are 10, 14, 16, and their whole lives have had to live in a, um, a third world country with some of these diseases that if they were just in a different area of the world could be treated right away. And so we are passionate and Cure International is passionate about that kind of injustice and, and reaching these children uh, for the sake of healing. So here is all of the locations around the world uh, where they serve. And our group specifically has, for the past year and a half, has had a partnership with Cure Philippines. And their hospital was founded in 2015 from Tim Tebow, because um, he was born in the Philippines. And so that is, we raise money for the children of that hospital and write letters and cards to them. Um, so. Cure is committed to healing for today, healing for tomorrow, and healing for eternity. So what then does this look like? What does Cure do? So as I talked about, they do medical healing, so they treat children with curable diseases. And they are primarily, uh, they do this through surgical practices, and because they uh, do club foot services, they also do castable club foot and different services like that and they are the largest provider of specialty surgical care in the developing world. So when we think of medical care, um, 
in the developing world, you don't, you don't usually see pediatric orthopedic hospitals. Um, it's kind of a niche that was very, um, yeah, rare to find. So CURE really found that gap and has provided um, a lot of hope for these children. They also provide spiritual healing. And one of my favorite aspects of CURE International is that they are passionate about holistic healthcare. So when these families come into the hospital, instead of these children just going through these uh, surgeries, um, each family is met at the door with a, spir a spiritual care provider who learns about the family's stories, uh, really cares for the emotional uh, well-being of the entire family, and also shares the hope of Jesus with them. Um, so they, work, they walk through the entire healthcare journey with the families, really providing uh, the resources that they need. <coughs> and then lastly, another very uh, unique and um, inspiring aspect of CURE is that they train national healers. So instead of it just being a bunch of, a bunch of expats coming into um, not their home country, they train up the local medical professionals. Um, and here are some, this article called A Sustainable Solution talks about how in India, they are teaching um, a castable clubfoot method called the Ponsu method to um, some local people because these children with, that need these casts need it once a week. And so they train, um, and they're not you know, invasive medical procedures, they're just casting. And so they uh, have doctors oversee local cast people, I don't remember what they're called, um, and they employ them and they send them through this specialized schooling program and they pay for it and it's yeah, a really cool way to provide infrastructure for these communities. So they've trained over 7,200 medical professionals, and then they also um, have a residency program in Uganda. One of, it's the largest neurosurgery center in Uganda, and they currently have 32 uh, residents in the program, in the training program, um, and 19 of the 32 are from um, low-income countries, which is really neat. Again, training up these doctors to then go work into these areas of care where they are from. Oh, and one thing I forgot to mention is the spiritual healers are all in their, they're all local community members. So again, they speak the, the local language and they really understand the cultural nuances. Um, another cool aspect for us as people who raise money for Cure International is they um, have a program called Cure Kids. So if you were ever to go on the Cure International website, you can type in a, a location and it shows, it highlights some of the stories of the children that are currently in the hospital. And it's real time. They have positions, um, yeah, they have people that their whole job is to tell the stories of these families and, and what they've been through and how uh, Cure is helping their healing process. And so we can read the stories and um, send cards and letters and videos to them. And last year our club sent a video to a child in the Philippines named Aldrin. And he actually, their uh, Cure Kid coordinator sent us a video back of him watching it. And so it's real time communication, which is um, pretty neat for us as the fundraisers. Um, and here's just some of the stats of the incredible work that Cure International has done. Again, it's only 22 years old, but it is in 26 countries worldwide. It has over 3.1 million outpatient visits and done 226,000 surgeries and 119,000 children have been treated at the Cure Club Foot Partners and 12,000 procedures to treat um, some of these physical abnormalities. So Cure International is a very unique and incredible organization. Uh, that reminds us of what God can do when, when you're used as his people. So. Oh, and then um, sometimes when we get these um, inspirational kind of charitable things like Cure International, we do want to make sure that their money uh, goes to the right places. So on their website, they're very transparent about their financial accountability and I know that over 90% of all proceeds go directly to 
providing these surgeries for free um, for the families that can't pay. So that is Cure International. And Mark's going to come up and talk about what Cure International at UIUC, us as a local chapter, does. Yeah. <clears throat> so, yeah, so just like Abby said, um, I'm going to be covering more of the Cure UIUC aspect of it because she just covered the Cure International part of it. So, I'm Mark. I'm the Vice President of Cure UIUC uh, here at the University of Illinois. I uh, I'm a junior here. I'm studying uh, biology. I'm trying to get minors in chemistry and English. I'm also pre-dental, so remember to floss when you get home. <laughs> for me, they start us young. Um, so let's get into uh, what your UIUC is. Um, so who we are, so our mission statement is we are a faith-based team of mission-minded students using your talents, time, and energy to support children in medically underserved regions of the world. So it's very similar to what Cure International does. We're just doing it uh, on campus and then representing uh, Cure uh, as best we can here. Um, so what do we do? So we do four main things. So every single thing that we do at Cure UIC falls into one of these categories. Uh, we're either organizing, volunteering, encouraging, or learning. Right, uh, and so organizing. So we organize fundraisers. That's kind of our bread and butter. That's the main thing that we do. Uh, we'll have bake sales. Uh, this actually counts as one of our fundraisers. So thank you for coming. Uh, and we also do movie nights. Uh, and so we're always kind of coming up with new things that we can do to raise money uh, for the uh, kids that we're supporting. Uh, so organizing fundraisers is a big thing that we're doing. Uh, but we also volunteer, and so that's what sets Cure apart from just being a regular old fundraising club on campus. Uh, and so we have a great uh, outreach share, Emily, and so Emily uh, sets up different uh, volunteering opportunities with organizations around the area. So if you're from the area, we help out with Salt and Light, and so uh, I'll talk about that a little later, as well as Gems, and so I'll talk about that a little later. So we volunteer, and then we also encourage, right? And so I was talking about this a little, um, but we have Cure Kids, and so uh, one cool thing about being a chapter is Cure will tell us uh, children in the hospital that we're supporting in the Philippines, and uh, we get to encourage them with cards, uh, we'll make videos for them, uh, I think some things in the work about like writing a song for them, and so we'll see if that pans out. But we do things to encourage the, student, uh, the kids in the hospital, and so uh, that's the third big thing. And the fourth big thing is we learn, and so one thing that we do is we learn how we can grow in our effectiveness and being mission-minded in the careers we're working towards. Uh, so that's kind of a mouthful, but really what that means is doing things like this, right? So Derek's going to come and speak, and so uh, this is big for students like us who are trying to find out how we can integrate uh, all the stuff we're learning about the mitochondria uh, and all the things that we want to do with our careers. And so a lot of us want to be doctors or dentists uh, or serve in some capacity in a non-for-profit or non-profit. So Cure UIC gives us a great opportunity to do that. Um, so. Why do we do it? That's probably a really good question to ask uh, just because um, we're doing a lot of things. And so we have three reasons for why we do it. Uh, we want to use what we've been given. We want to unite people on campus. And we want to build a community of mission-minded students, right? And so uh, use what we've been given. So a lot of people come to the University of Illinois, and they have a lot of talents and a lot of resources. And they really want to know how they can use both of those things uh, to make the world a better place. And so Cure UIUC sees our goal here uh, to take those students in and say, OK, you want to help the world? with your stuff here. Here's an opportunity to do that, right? Uh, and so that's one of the big reasons why we are doing what we do up here. Um, the second reason is unite, uniting people on campus. So uh, there's actually quite a bit of division on college campuses these days, but it's hard to be divided on trying to help children get surgeries paid for. So we are trying to unite the campus on a common goal of supporting children who need our help. Uh, and so we do this through bake sales to raise awareness. Uh, a lot of our fundraisers that we do on campus are also to raise awareness in that same way. Um, and so that's one way that we're trying to unite uh, people on campus uh, for kind of a bigger cause. Uh, and then the third thing that we do is we build community. And this comes uh, really from uh, the first two, right? So people having an opportunity to use what they've been given. Uh, and then people trying to be united uh, for a bigger cause, right? And so uh, building community looks like we'll have social events. Sometimes we'll get everybody out to go get dinner. Uh, but a lot of times the, uh, the community gets built when we're serving together, right? Um, and if you're in church groups, you know that better than anybody, right? Because when you, you make a lot of your lifelong friends on mission trips, uh, mostly because you're both dying in the same heat together, right? And so that's something uh, that we do in Cure, which is uh, super beneficial in building community. Uh, especially with mission-minded students, right? So when you come to Cure, you're meeting people who also want to use their talents uh, to serve other people. And so uh, that leads to really good friendships down the road uh, and, and hopefully uh, careers that line up. So that's why we do it. Keep going. Um, so this kind of, oh, sorry. 
opportunity, sorry. Um, so, uh, so curating is a lot of different opportunities, right? Um, and so a lot of the questions that we face as an exec board on quad day, which is our big activity sphere, or when we meet uh, you know, civilians on the quad in general, uh, they say, why should I join CURE, right? Uh, and so we have a couple different reasons why CURE is actually doing a lot of cool things for students on campus. And so the first thing is we are an incubator, and I, I'm really proud of this word. So um, we, are CURE, we see CURE as an incubator, we see CURE as a startup, uh, where a lot of other clubs just see themselves as a fundraising club or a service club. Uh, we actually view ourselves as, as a startup of Cure International on campus, right? And so um, one thing that we do that we're really proud of is we provide opportunities for students to showcase their own talents uh, in the confines of Cure UIUC, right? And so why does this matter? Um, so the fact of the matter is a lot of people who join Cure UIUC are trying to get to medical school or graduate school or trying to get a job, right? Uh, and so when you're applying to jobs or medical school or dental school or what have you, uh, a lot of those schools uh, are more interested in what you're doing in college as opposed to what you join in college. Uh, and so at Cure, what we're trying to do is give students an opportunity to say, hey, I'm passionate about baking cookies and selling them uh, to people on Green Street, right? Uh, what we do is, at Cure is we say, okay, that's great. Here are your resources, go do it, right? And so we're giving students an opportunity uh, to use their talents and then have something to show for it when they go uh, to med school applications, dental school, or what have you. So um, that's kind of a main thing. And so again, it's a space to show what you can do. And so you can organize an event, uh, plan a fundraiser, and then uh, we'll come alongside you and help you get that done. So that's uh, one thing. Um, be on mission together. Uh, this is actually a huge opportunity, especially if you're coming from like a, a faith-based background. So I'm a Christian, so I grew up in a Presbyterian church, and so we did a lot of service and mission trips and all that. Uh, and so when I found out about Cure, uh, this was actually one of my favorite parts, is there's an opportunity to be on mission together uh, in a career-focused way, right? Um, and so we provide students with opportunity to serve together. And so uh, one thing that we do is salt and light. So I was talking about this a little bit earlier. Uh, and so salt and light is, uh, and if you're uh, from the Champaign area, you've probably heard of it. Uh, if not, uh, it's basically a something of a food pantry, but it's kind of like a food pantry on steroids where you can kind of go, you can work in uh, the grocery store and then earn credit and use that credit to go buy groceries or what have you. So it's a way that you can um, kind of earn uh, food even if you're not able to find a job. So it's a really cool uh, organization that's here. They're also faith-based, so we go volunteer with them and help out. Uh, but one of the big things that we've been doing recently is GEMS. And so GEMS actually stands for uh, God Empowering Mothers Who Are Single. And so it actually goes on at Windsor Road Church, which is just a stone's throw away from campus. Uh, and so we drive there every other weekend, or no, every other Wednesday, sorry. Uh, and we um, watch, basically watch after the kids as the moms go and have their Bible study. And so it's a good way for us to disciple and mentor younger children um, who are just looking for positive influences in their life. And so at Cure, we can give that to them. So uh, we do that, and then we do bake sales. And so the bake sales are kind of, like I was saying, the bread and butter. And so that's like, a, we'll just walk up and down Green Street. So Green Street's kind of like the main, the heart of campus town. We walk up and down Green Street um, selling cookies and raising awareness for Cure. Um, it's a good way to spread the word about what we do, but it's also a good way to serve together. And so a lot of uh, the close friendships that get knit and Cure kind of start at the bake sales where we're kind of trying to sell cookies to people who might not want to buy them. So uh, that's there. And then the third opportunity that we do is we offer a lot of mentorship, right? So there are a lot of opportunities for upperclassmen mentorship. Um, and so one cool thing about Cure is we're kind of taking the idea of Christian discipleship and then applying it to college students who are kind of focus on career goals, right? Uh, and so I'm a junior, right? And so uh, I, there's a buddy of mine who's a sophomore, and so every Friday the two of us meet up. Uh, we talk about life, but we also talk about careers and school and how's that going and stuff like that. Um, and so the idea is, um, God willing, the upperclassmen who mentor the underclassmen uh, do it so well that the underclassmen grow up into upperclassmen and then mentor the new generation of underclassmen. Uh, and so that's one way that we kind of uh, we're, we're kind of kind of stealing plays out of Jesus's playbook and using discipleship in our club, uh, and it's actually really cool and it's really beneficial. So that's one way that we're kind of building new leaders uh, who are focused on using their talents uh, for the sake of the kingdom. So, yeah, and then just want to say thank you for coming, uh, and uh, we're going to trans uh, transition to the next thing. So, thank you. Um, if you have a chance to talk to them afterwards, they are very passionate about here and you'd like them to know. Um, now I'm going to go ahead and give you a little bit of background about our speaker, Derek. 
Derek Glanville was born in South Africa and came to America at the age of 25 with a mere $200 looking for an opportunity. As an overachiever, Derek Glanville spent, has since spent more than 33 years in the executive leadership roles in engineering and the construction industry. He is the retired president and COO of McCarthy Holdings, a top 10 global construction company with the annual sales of over $4 billion. He currently live, serves as the senior advisor and executive chairman of portfolio companies for Oak Tree Capital Energy and Power Private Equity Funds, as well as where God leads him as a passionate Christ follower. After many achievements and success in what he calls his halftime decision, Derek retired from McCarthy and is following his passion to live life with more purpose, serving others as Christ has led him to do so. He has a passion for leading and coaching in both business and the nonprofit world. He oversees a large, large pediatric brain injury foundation in honor of his son, Seen, who tragically passed away in 2015. He often speaks about the tragedy of losing his son, Seen, and how his family was able to cope only through God's grace. When Seen was severely handicapped in a freak car accident, Derek saw it as an opportunity to inspire others through establishing a pediatric brain industry foundation and to race with Seen in endurance triathlon events to tell others God's love during strategy. He believes that while he doesn't have the answers to all the questions of suffering, that God has a plan for all of us and that death and suffering was never intended in God's plan. We also have a calling to serve others, especially as Christ cared for those who he called the least of these. On behalf of Cure International and Cure UAUC, we welcome Derek to share his testimony of faith and hope. Please welcome Derek. Wonderful job. One correction. My son's name is Sean. Really? Yeah. Not, and he Sorry. just spells it funny. And, and so I speak funny as well because I'm from Africa. But, I, you know, I, I will tell you folks, I don't believe in coincidences at all. I don't know about you guys, but I, I really don't believe that, that, that things just happen. Um, I think God puts us in places for a specific reason. And, and the reason I'm here today is because of a connection and, and a... Um, the courage of, of a young lady that came up to me in, in New York City when we were taking a company public um, with her family with all there and she, she had the courage to cross the room and came up to me and said, you're going to come to University of Illinois and come and speak at my event, the Cure uh, International. And I said, oh really, yeah, that's what I'm going to do. And I, I said, well let me think about that. And it took me about 10 seconds because I could see um, her heart and I could see the passion for what she was doing as I dug into it, the coincidence just really unfolded more and more and more. I found out this is a faith-based organization. Yay God, I can I can speak to to you know to encourage everyone in the kingdom of God. So how about that? I uh, I did lose my son tragically in a he was in a motor car accident on his way to to high school at uh, 13 years old and unfortunately the dad went off the road, hit his head, traumatic brain injury Less than one percent chance of living. He lived for another seven and a half years, severely handicapped, and he um, he passed away in, in 2015. But in the process of doing that, a couple of things happened. One is um, I really sort of had this, this calling to to really you know get out of this big rat race of called the business world and, and really to to live a life with more purpose. So everything I do now is for the kingdom. Yes, I work hard. Yes, I'm on the board of eight companies. Do all that all that silly stuff, but. At the end, at the end, it's all about the kingdom. It's all about what I can do to, to give back. So, a couple of more connection points and call them coincidences or put them, call them God's will. Basically, you know, I'm from Africa, and a lot of this is Africa. And I've seen the tragedy in Africa. I'm there every uh, year for at least four to six weeks. I've seen kids with club feet. Now, you don't see them walking around around the city of Chicago or. Champagne. You don't. You don't. You don't know what I'm talking about. I'm talking about kids that are totally uh, either walking on on hands and uh, you know walking four four uh, four legged as they say, or are just sitting on the side of the road as outcasts. Because when you're born that way, when you look funny or you look different in an Africa sense or even in a global sense, you you become rejected and you become out outcast. And I think it. I think this speaks exactly to the mission of what, what Cure is all about. I, I, I think that um, 
you know, it also just ties back to the foundation that, that I run. I spent a lot of time in Africa with, with putting water wells in uh, with an organization called Living Water International. And our whole goal there is sort of similar to, uh, to the Cure mission, which is not about the water well. It's about creating water so that the, 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 the ladies can stop walking to go get their cholera-infested water so they can come back and take care of the kids so they can teach them, so they can spread the gospel. And it's always through a, a pat, local pastor. So in the same way, Cure delivers healing of club feet and hydrocephalus and things like that, but they really deliver the, the healing that comes from the heart. And I think that that is way more powerful and way more uh, you know, significant than, than, than just sort of the medical cure. And, and I, I really um, look at you guys and I say, I mean, way to go. I mean, what you're doing is incredible. I mean, that, but the leadership at, at your age, you're doing what you guys are doing and as articulate as you were up here, I mean, I just like to sit down there and listen to you talk a little bit more because I've got a few things to say or what I what I put together, but what you say is is really much more significant, and so I commend you for that. Our brain injury foundation, pediatric brain injury foundation, another coincidence is it's about children. It's not. It's really, really we focus on the brain because most of the money that goes towards uh, the brain, which is this, this only organ in the body, think about it is your heart, your lung, your kidneys, everything else can be transplanted and, and replaced by some other part, but the brain cannot be. It's the one part that we can't really do much for. But in our focus of, of where funds go across uh, the world, it's mostly to what we call neurodegenerative type diseases. ALS, Parkinson's, Alzheimer's, all these end of life, what I call diseases, which are very sad and very significant, but we, we don't really spend, for every hundred dollars we spend there, we spend one penny on kids a little bit on cerebral palsy. So my passion is about kids. And what I liked about uh, Cure International, I like a lot of things about Cure International, the thing I like the most is Cure Kids because it's about children and our focus in our foundation is about kids. One of the things that I like to do and go back in is we have some clinical trials. We're connected to St. Louis Children's Hospital where I live, but also 12 other children's hospitals around the uh, um, country. And we have these clinical programs in hydrocephalus okay and which is exactly where cure um, is involved in. so basically what happens is when you when your brain is impacted and it swells <coughs> it creates that swelling which increases your you know intracranial brain pressure goes up and causes this thing called hydrocephalus and some of the kids it translates to sort of the, the kids with the big heads but most of the times it doesn't most time the kids die from it because they can't drain that that pressure build up it's trapped inside the skull so they put in what they call shunts, which actually drain that. So we have a shunt program that I want to connect our doctors to, which are again, 12 neurocritical care, neurosurgeons, if you will, that potentially could make an impact into that by putting um, technology. There was a guy I was talking to you earlier about technology. How do you put technology into a medical application to help people? So there's an application there. So anyway, long story short, let me, Go to if you if you mind go back to what I was going to talk about. But I wanted to give you that preamble to let you know that this is uh, uh, just if there's if there's one takeaway, many takeaways tonight for you. But just remember, God prepares you for situations, and all we have to do is listen. And in this case, it was all for me. It was just a situation of listening to where God really told me to be, and that's yet tonight with you folks. Because I think this is part of a story that's not just an event, it's part of a, a, a mission, it's part of a journey. And for all you young folks that are here listening to this, at this tonight, there's many things, many takeaways for, for you tonight. But the thing that I uh, fundamentally, as a Christ follower, always feel it's important to do is to be realistic and authentic about, about life and about what we talk about. So while I, I, I address some of the stuff might sound a little preachy to you, okay, and I, and I don't apologize for that, because it will sound preachy, but it'll also give you some, um, some challenging thoughts to think about. You know, so, some really big questions, like why does God allow, to ha allow this to happen, right? Why does this happen to all of us? And then more important than that is, what are you gonna do? Are you prepared for the inevitable pain and suffering that everything that's gonna come to you? All right, so uh, how do you deal with that? And, and I, I've spoken to many, many uh, parents, many families about, about that, because I spent 18 months in the intensive care environment, sleeping in the chair next to my son while we were saving his life. And uh, 
I saw so many folks, so many families fall apart because they couldn't come to grips with this, this idea of why, why this didn't make sense. Okay, so there's this, there's a sort of, I don't have all the answers, I'm not going to give you a, a checklist or a flowchart, sorry, to, to go away and just fill out and then you'll know. But I, I do hope to, to just sort of stimulate you with a bunch of questions and then to, to almost get you to think about the inevitable and, and say to yourself, you know, how, how does this, what does this mean? So there was a, a poll, for example, reminds me of a poll that was taken several years ago. Sorry, for old people wear glasses, so I have to. Um, understand. You understand? You know what I'm saying? <laughs> um, there was a poll a few years ago um, that they took, and, and uh, the question was, if you can ask God one thing, if, if God was here today and you had a face-to-face, one-on-one, you can ask him one thing, what would that be? So they went out and did the survey and they collected everybody's questions and, and the number one overwhelming question that came back was, you know, the question by far was, why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? That was the question people really wanted to know. They basically said, you know, and if you really wanted to make it difficult, they, they really would challenge God and say, if you're a loving God, then why is there so much pain and suffering in the world? And that, that's a tough question. Perhaps one day, you know, we'll, we'll, get, it, we'll get that direct answer. But, um, you know, and there's a sort of this intellectual answer to the question that we can go on quite a bit intellectually about it. But, uh, you know, you can't just stay in the textbooks because ultimately that's not the answer that you're going to want. Because um, sure enough, when, when you face it, come on in. Take a seat. Thanks. Uh, when you face it, okay, when, not, not yet, but when you face it, when suffering or hurt or loss or disappointment comes to you and puts a scar on your heart, you're going to really want to know the answer to it, right? beyond just the intellectual side of it. So again, I don't have all the answers to it, uh, and God is actually quite frustratingly silent about, about giving a, a total explanation, but I will say this, the Bible gives you the best framework that I've ever seen, okay? I think the Christian response gives us more, way more uh, things than I've ever seen uh, in, in, or encountered. Um, and the, the thing about it is, pain comes to each one of our lives. Pain comes in all sizes, shapes, and, and, and forms. Um, but it's just not that we know what it's like to hurt. We, we know what it's like to hurt when it doesn't make sense. Okay, when, when you see that it doesn't make sense, okay, why does that happen? In fact, there's this, there's this famous novelist called Peter de Vries, and, and the, the quote I liked there about that was he said, it's like the question mark turned like a fish hook into the human heart, okay, which is this painful realization of why this, this happens. So, you know, you even look at, you go to the Bible and you say, well, maybe I can get some sense there, but, but even Jesus said in John 16, he said, in this life, you will have trouble. I mean, he was pretty candid, blunt, and said to us, in this life, sooner or later, you're going to run into sheer pain, betrayal, hurt, maybe even injustice. It's going to happen. So, the question I ask is, why does that have to happen? Okay, what's God thinking of? to allow that to people that he loves. But you keep reading, because you keep going in John 16, and, you can, and I encourage you to do this. It says, in this world you have trouble, but he goes on to say, but take heart, for I've overcome the world. Take heart, because I've overcome the world. So that means there is hope, it is real, and we can, we can hang on to that, right? But what does he mean by overcome the world? Notice I'm, a, I'm an engineer by degree, by the way, so I, I ask a lot of questions and always want to, want to know the answer. And so I, I, I think, you know, what does he mean by overcoming the world? And let's be a little bit more specific. What's God doing about some of these things that we see in the world? What is he doing about the evil, the darkness, the injustice of the world? What is he doing with this stuff? Why we let that happen? So the start of the answer for me goes back to this whole notion of what we call moral freedom, right? So here's, here's the thing. God built into the creation that we weren't robots, we weren't mechanics. He could have programmed us to do anything and we would have re responded exactly as he programmed because he's a very good programmer, right? The ultimate healer, right? But he, uh, he built into creation uh, this thing we have freedom, freedom of choice, choosing those things. But unfortunately, with the choice comes consequences, right? Most of the suffering in, in the world, I will tell you, is because we bring upon it on ourselves, right? Think about it, Chris. I mean, you eat too much, you sweat too little, um, your health will suffer, right? You spend too much, you save too little, your financial health will suffer. 
You take too much and give too little, your friendships will suffer. You work too much and listen too little, your family will suffer. It's just the way it works, right? So our choices are consequences, and then this freedom that God put into the story that means your, cho your choices could have consequences on others. And sometimes suffering and pain comes into our life, not because of the cho choices we made, but because of the choice that the other guy made, right? That makes it sort of unfair on us. And then there's this other kind of suffering, okay, that's even, even beyond our understanding. I mean, it's not got to do with anything about choice. I mean, cancers aren't necessarily because of choice. Birth defects. Hurricanes, we just had one. Earthquakes, when a tire blows out in a car, someone gets bitten by a poisonous spider. Um, and in fact, in cure kids, where these kids are born with club feet, where's the choice there? There wasn't a choice at all. So, again, I go back to the Bible, and, and unfortunately, the Bible is frustratingly silent on this part also. But here's what it does say what it does say is, right from the beginning of human history, we abused this freedom. We made the wrong choices. We chose poorly. At the very moment where we distrusted God's goodness, from that place on, there's kind of been this disruption, the spoiling relationship between us and God, between us and each other, and between us and His plan. Theologians call this the fall of humanity. It's how we explain the massive disruption in the creation that was caused by a rebellion. Right into the first three chapters of Genesis, it starts right there. And for the rest of that, it, everything seems to fall apart. It affects every corner, every generation, every part of society, and it hasn't stopped, it keep, keeps on going. But, God doesn't like the way things are going either. And He hasn't given up on the planet. And He hasn't given up on the story. In fact, if you keep reading from Genesis 3, and those of you that spend any time in the Bible will know that the rest of the Bible is sort of this God's story of restoring and, uh, and restoring that creation to, the rest of, to, to its original state. Um, that's basically what the Bible is all about. So why is this suffering? It's suffering because of the defined choices that have pushed us away from God and pushed this whole thing out of orbit. Because it never was God's way. What did He do? He limited His own power. He chose not to force Himself on us and create robots of us. He built some wiggle room into the story though. Why? Why did He do that? So that love can be experienced as a gift. So that we would come to Him not be pre-programmed, but forced, and not forced, but we would choose Him, and in love, we would, He would re respond to us. So that isn't, that isn't the end of the story. One day, I, I firmly believe this, and it's coming, and we'll just have to go to Revelation 21, you'll see uh, that the promise is there. There'll come a day when God addresses all the darknesses and injustices that ever be committed. God hates it when tragedy occurs, and He hates what He did to my son Sean, He hates what it does to these kids, He hates what it does to anything uh, that you, you all might have encountered. And one day, there will come a day when God will step into the story and say, that's it, okay? I'm going to now contain this, and it's not going to go any further. I believe we have a righteous God, and He won't be mocked. He is our God of justice. There's a writer of Ecclesiastes, he, Ecclesiastes, he put it this way, in due season, God will judge everything man does, both good and bad. That means that the end isn't the end of the story. So those are the questions. I don't have the answers for them. But then what happens if tragedy does come? How do you deal with it? How do you deal with when, uh, when, when, when there's death, when there's pain, when there's sorrow, when someone disappoints you, when someone rejects you? When someone, how do you deal with that deep hurt? And how do you get past it, right? I just want to give you three handles to sort of take away today with. One is struggle, surrender, and hope. And if you can just remember that as I go through these things, this is my story and how I uh, was were able to deal with, with the, this, uh, what we struggle with as a family. Um, what I've learned is the first thing that happens to you, okay, uh, is you struggle, you battle. I mean, you get extremely upset and you get extremely disappointed. But, but the thing about it is, you just can't deal with it until you actually deal with it. So you start to deal with it. And the way you do that is quite honestly the same way as many have done in the Bible. You cry out to God, and you admit, and you pray, and you say, this doesn't make sense. God, why are you doing this to me? And I will tell you, there's nothing wrong with that. Okay, There's great biblical precedent for time and time again in Scripture. God didn't snuff people out because they admitted how they were really feeling. Right? I can show you place after place where people showed strong emotion to God. And God isn't afraid of our strong emotions, okay? And this is how, this is how I struggle um, 
And again, 18 months in the intensive care, I, I, you know, I would just pray openly to God. I, I didn't know where to start sometimes. I just opened the book of Psalms and I would start reading them. And, uh, uh, but I will tell you that, that I paid attention because something happened in the middle of all that. God seemed to show up in very, very quiet ways. Because I've never felt the presence of God as when I sat alone there at night with my son, praying over him, crying over him, and feeling God comfort me. So this idea of struggling with God and, and feeling the love that, that comes from eternity is, is um, it's real. So there are places on your spiritual journey where you'll question openly, and you're going to struggle. You'll struggle with why is this happening to you, your voice has concerns, and you'll tell God that, that, that this isn't fair. It's just how it works, okay? Uh, but this also keeps you engaged, keeps you in the conversation and not disconnected from God. That keeps you right in the middle of it by, by communicating with Him, tell Him about your pain. And there's no better story in the Bible that I could find is, is that ancient story, perhaps one of the most ancient stories in the Bible, is about the a guy by the name of Job. So, you know, it's, Job was a guy with very strong faith, okay? And he had, it starts off, he had everything. I mean, he was rock and rolling. Things were going great for all Job, okay? And, and in the middle of the story, very early on, he kind of just lost everything, right? I mean, he lost everything that he, that he cared for. Um, and he ends up sitting on a heap of ashes in the middle of the town then trying to make sense of it all. And uh, Job starts to do the struggling. He starts to starts to, you know, do it openly and it's raw. And if you've read it, I mean, it, he asks some very tough questions and he's challenging God. And in fact, when, when Job asks God, why am I suffering? Why, am I, why is this happening? God, in a very loving, a very helpful way, God begins to turn around and ask Job questions. He asks him questions about the creation. How, Job, do you know how the universe works? Do you know how this all comes together? Do you know who... Job, do you know who's really in charge here? When you read the story of Job, God doesn't reveal this grand design. He reveals himself. He says, Job, listen, I know you want the answers, okay? But you can't handle the answers. You can't handle it from my perspective. Kind of a Jack Nicholson moment. <laughs> <laughs> said, but what he does say is, but you can trust me. I'm here. I'm on the job, Job. Okay? And then you sort of get to this place where you say, okay, and again, be the engineer and the project manager and the leader of the family and the leader of big business and all that stuff. I, I had to go through all of that, struggle with all of this, and get to the point where you get to that frustrating, terrifying, powerful, powerful powerless, liberating place of what we call surrender. Surrender is when you, you go back and forth. Okay, So we struggle, now we surrender. You go back and forth, letting go of things for a little bit, a little bit. In the middle of the surrender, you get to a place you admit if you need help, you can't do this by yourself. In fact, in the middle of this, you get to this point where you, you get to realization of what we call, oh yeah, I'm not God, okay? Now, I don't realize, I realize most of us will say we're not bold enough to say we are God, and we don't, we kind of act that way sometimes, don't we? Right? In fact, there's this uh, famous author, Anne Lamott, I love her quote, I think we all need this. Anne says, the biggest difference between you and God is God doesn't think he's you, okay? And that's what it means to surrender. You see this, because uh, that's where some of us get really stuck. It, gets, it stops us from trusting God. It stops us from going forward. It keeps us uh, from admitting that we all need help. It keeps, it keeps us from taking the next step to the answer that we, we really long for. So when you look at Jeremiah, you look at Paul, David, Job, all of them, you ultimately read their stories. They often don't get the answers. They mostly lead to more questions. But you know what they do get? They don't get the answers, but they get the answer up. They get the presence of God alongside them. So I don't know why God doesn't answer all my prayers the way I beg Him to answer all of them. I don't know why some of my friends and family suffer the way they do. I don't know why they, these kids are born this way, okay? But, and I don't have all the answers for the questions. But I'll tell you, in every instance, as I complain to God and, and voice that, there's a God that settles up next to me and says, Son, I ride this journey with you. Wraps his arms around him, and that's why I trust him. Because there's a God who's chosen to step into the mess. He takes our suffering so seriously that he chose to experience it himself, right? He knows betrayal. He knows torture. He knows rejection. He knows sorrow. He knows it all. God said, because my son will die on the cross, I'll ultimately break the stranglehold of pain on the story. So I'm going to take the consequence. I'm going to take the suffering. 
I will take all the evil in the world, pile it on me, and somehow end this thing. How does that happen? I don't exactly know. But when Jesus dies, things happen. The story of the cross is good news because it means that the story is going forward. God doesn't look at this and say, well, look what the mess you made. Good luck with that. What he says is, let me enter into the mess and I'll satisfy my sense of justice. I'll take this on me and exhaust the power of evil and suffering. So the idea of struggling and surrendering are then interwoven into this third concept, which is the deeper mystery of faith, which means to live with God. And it's called hope. Okay? Hope is your answer. Hope's what sometimes gets you up in the morning, right? Isaiah said in uh, Isaiah 40 said, Those that hope in the Lord will renew their strength. In some translations of Isaiah, some will say that those who wait on the Lord are those who trust on the Lord. You notice those, those words. When you hope, when you wait, you trust the Lord. It's not a passive thing. Isaiah uses actually a Hebrew word yeah, to, to explain this, and this is a word called kava. And what kava is, it's in its original meaning, is something that means interwoven together, right? Kind of when you braid things together to give it greater strength. It's referred to when you're creating cable or you're making a rope. That's what kava is, okay? The idea of this hoping on God idea of waiting on God means you trust Him enough so you'll wrap your last strand of your life around God's strength and that'll be enough. So we trust. We trust. We hope. Listen, I, I can't make things right between me and God. Okay? There are no amount of religious hoops I can jump through that will offset the moral failures of my life. The Bible is pretty clear on that. Being religious doesn't cut it. It comes down to me trusting. Will I trust God enough? Will I wrap my life around His strength? Will I trust that God, what He's done for me already, is enough? God, I need you. And that's where you start. So I want to be crystal clear about this whole thing. Okay? The Bible says life's a gift. Death and suffering were never in God's plan. They only crept into the story because of our rebellion and our choices, our sin. Ever since then, God's been focused on redeeming and restoring the world. Everything led to the cross. All of you, what you're doing with this program, matters. It means that death is ultimately defeated. God gets the last word. Pain and suffering doesn't get the last word. Also means in the middle of the struggle, and this sort of in between time between this side of eternity, we do get God's grace, we get His presence, His strength, His comfort. We even get joy alongside the pain sometimes in a way it doesn't make sense. We find meaning and purpose to what we do. We find direction to our lives. So we struggle, we question, we seek, we surrender. Sometimes, we, little by little, we, we decide which way to go. But we decide to take this life with God, who's overcome all these things. So that, that's basically my message to you tonight is, you know, we don't have all the answers to the questions and, and why this happens, but we do know there's a loving God out there that, that cares for us, that cares for every one of you, and what you're doing with your lives, and, and some of you are young folks, you've got, you got your whole lives ahead of you. The choices that you make matter. God notices, and He has a plan for you, and He will guide you and direct you, but you will, you will have trouble. Take heart, though. I've overcome the world. So, that that's kind of leads us to sort of why we're here and, and again I, uh, I uh, would like to on behalf of myself and perhaps a lot of others in the room would just say where to go with what you guys are doing okay and, and the legacy that you create there I think you talked about passing this on to other generations how do you inspire other other folks to take the baton because you're going to go be this world-class dentist and and you're going to be, you're going to be this rock star, I don't know. You're a surgeon, what are you going to do? And Mariah, you're going to, you're going to change the world, I'm sure, as well. And, and so will each one of you. But um, at the end of the day, if you can sustain this and, and keep it going, nothing will, will give me greater pleasure. Um, unfortunately, what, what drives the organizations like this is money. And, and, and you know, you need to uh, realize that, that, that uh, your resources, and I've really learned this uh, the hard way, is that resources matter, okay? And that's why I work so hard now, is to be able to give back to organizations like this. First Corinthians 13.8, we all know the passage, right? We all know what Paul wrote, right? 
And, that, and these three things remain, faith, hope, and love. The greatest of all is love. If you go to the King James Version of, of that, it'll tell you that uh, sometimes the word love is, is translated as charity. And we all know what that means. So we have, we're called on, we're called on to, to be able to love one another, to give back to the least of these, and nothing would uh, give me more pleasure than to do it for children, children that are rejected, children that, are, that need help, children that can't do it on their own, children that don't have parents <coughs> that have, it, have even any means to be able to start to think about how to do this. So I think we're called to do this, folks, okay? And, and I think that, um, uh, again, I don't believe in coincidences and I don't believe I'm here tonight to, to just, you know, say a few nice things to you and, and wish you good luck. I think the calling for me here tonight is to, is to start this sort of um, ask for you to think about your resources and what you can contribute. And, and I'll even say to the young folks, I know you, your, your students, we don't have any money, right? You don't, you don't have anything to do this, but let me get you to think about this. It costs $1,000 to do a surgery. $1,000 gets a kid life changed forever. Not only does that kid, that thousand dollars, make that kid walk or live or back get back into society, but that's a that's one life for God. Maybe many lives, because maybe the whole family hears about Jesus and is able to uh, then make a decision about where they are and, and uh, the kingdom grows. So maybe you just skip a movie this weekend. Maybe you don't get that Frappuccino double latte with mocha and whatever the hell do you do it <laughs> at Starbucks, because I, I can't figure it out why you want to copy in paragraphs. Um, <laughs> maybe you don't do that for a while, okay? But uh, everyone has a little number here, and there's no pressure on you. You don't have to give. You don't have to. You're not, you're not being told to give anything. You need to do it if, if God speaks to you and it's on your heart to do so. Um, I, I would like to think that tonight, um, Bob, Abby, Mariah, th I'd like to think that tonight we can make a big difference, okay? Um, and I will tell you, my son's foundation, the Scene Sean Pediatric Brain <laughs> Foundation, uh, is willing to start off the bidding tonight. And uh, we would we'd like to start. Actually, what we'd like to do is we're going to go from high to low, right? So get out the Starbucks money because it's coming, even for you, okay? Um, the, the idea is that, is that uh, I'll, I'll just throw out some numbers and, and wherever God tells you your position, you, you raise your hand, nobody's looking, we'll write your number down, you get with the folks afterwards and, and figure out how how they get your check or, or your credit card or however that works. But um, but I'll start the bidding, okay? And I'll tell you that the, the Sean Glanville uh, Pediatric Brain Injury Foundation will commit to your organization and uh, what you so passionately are working on. $10,000. And um, we hope that you will use that well. Okay? Because if that's 10,000 kids, they get surgery or, or it's it's the, the next surgeon that gets trained, then we'd like to see that happen. Um, after that, I, I'm number, number six or number nine. I don't know which one. <laughs> <laughs> That's me, okay? It's part of the problem. Is anybody to give $5,000? What number are you, sir? Number seven will get $5,000. Actually, I brought another five thousand dollars from a friend of mine driving up here. He he was supposed to come tonight. His name's Terry Montgomery. He's a dear friend, a person myself. And Terry said, "I can't come." He said, "But why don't you take the money of my plane ticket for my wife and I and give that to um, Cure as well?" So he's in for five thousand dollars. Terry's in for five as well. He's number nine if you're number six. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I don't know. Yeah, actually. Yeah, you're right. Um, no, Terry's in for that. So, so we have um, we we had a good start there, didn't we? I mean, did, just you want to keep going? Right. Yeah, let's keep going. Let's, keep let's going. go down a little. Let's go down a little. Yeah. Bit, okay. Uh, I don't know. What's the next level down? Anybody give a thousand dollars? 
gentleman over there, number 20. Thank you, sir. You gentleman. And he's from the good construction industry. <laughs> um, $500? How about $200? Anybody in for $200? 100 Oh, $200 in the back. What's your number, sir? 49. 49. Thank you, sir. Thanks so much. Um, where are we at? $100? We got a couple. What's your number, sir? 10. Number 10. And your number in the back? 5. 10 and 5 are in for 100. Uh, let's see, what's our next number now? 50? We're approaching Starbucks. How about $20? We have for 20? a joint contribution from 1 in 50. <laughs> <laughs> is that $150? What is no, 1 in 50 will give? $20 combined. <laughs> with all, with all the money I have. So. <laughs> 10 and 10. A for effort. 20, 19 and 1 or something along this line. And we also have number 3 and we have number 27. Okay, so now how about 10 bucks? Who will give 10 bucks? <laughs> number 17. Number 2. Number four, number 28. I don't have a number. And that <laughs> gentleman over there. Zero, zero. He's number zero, zero. You wait, wait, can you re hold up the tens? Uh, 28. But oh, you don't have one? Four. Oh, we got 28. Four. Two. And. I don't have a number. Either. <laughs> number 99. <laughs> Okay. Anybody else I left out? Okay. Eight and twenty-five were for twenty. Eight and twenty-five were for twenty. That's a lot of Starbucks lattes. <laughs> 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 Four Starbucks lattes. Yeah. <laughs> I've never drank one myself. I, I just work on coffee, but then, and then my daughter has this paragraph. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I um, I think that was great. Yeah, you got it. I don't want to hijack the whole meeting, but can I say a prayer? Yeah, mm. absolutely. Okay, we'll go ahead. Father God, we come before you as a brother to people united in faith and community. Lord, we wrestle with so many questions this side of eternity that only you have answers for. I'm so grateful that we get to come to you directly with our questions and our concerns in the name of Jesus. We ask for you to be with us this evening as we depart. Let us listen for your voice as we continue to discuss together what it means to do life in your presence and for your purpose. Lord, we pray for all those who work so hard to prepare this event tonight. May you comfort them and show them that you're unfailing love and gratitude for all they have done for the children of Kiev. That you hold them when the cure keeps close and remind them that only one, the only one true hope that you provide is what they need. We also pray for cure leadership, the doctors and the volunteers, the many people around the world who passionately give themselves to those that need. We continue to guide them so that be your will will be done. And please give them the courage and the wisdom as they care for the least of these. May we all turn our eyes to you, Lord, that you be given the glory. Let this just not be another sad story for children, but a calling to action for a stronger relationship with you, to pray, prepare for our own eventual loss, to serve those in need, especially children, and to admit, in the end of the end, no matter what, your grace is and will always be sufficient. You are mighty to save. In Jesus' name, amen. 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 Back to you, Mark. Nobody the speaker doesn't do the fundraising. <laughs> I love that. <laughs> wow, I am blown away. Um, yesterday, Abby and I came here to pray over this event, and we just prayed, God, blow our expectations out of the water. And, yeah, <laughs> all of them. Um, yeah, so guys, this is, this is just the beginning. Um, we can do so much more after this. Like We today are going to help so many children but this is just the beginning. So if you wanna get connected with Cure, you can come over to the sign-up table and we can get your information. And yeah, just thank you all so much for coming and thank you all of the students for coming. You guys are doing incredible things on the University of Illinois campus. So yeah, thank you all. Thank you.